Welcome to the Investing Ahead podcast. I'm Tom Curran. Today we have Emily Bornhurst. Emily is a, a certified financial planner. She is our senior wealth manager. Uh, she's been with Curran now for 11 years, and uh, it's so good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Emily, we want to talk a little bit about clients, uh, particularly newer clients Sure. Uh, at this time. What do you think people are looking for uh, when they come to us and they've, uh, let's say, changed their advisors? That That's always a difficult thing for most people to do. What is it that you think uh, makes them uh, look around, come to us? Um, tell us what you think the industry should be doing better. Sure. I think clients are most interested in feeling understood. And, uh, you know, that is, could apply to multiple different meanings, understood in their financial situation, understood in their investments, understood um, in their goals and their objectives. And I think it's easy for an advisor to put together an investment plan and put together, you know, a financial plan or a retirement plan um, that is maybe good on paper, but is not diving deep into what makes every client unique. What is their specific goals? What is, what's this money supposed to do for them over their lifetimes? And um, feeling understood and feeling heard from the beginning, I think is, is most important. And so when we meet with new clients that are transitioning from another advisor, I think um, the investment piece is important, certainly. But I, I think what I find personally is the focus of the meeting is, you know, what is most important to you and how can we help you achieve those goals and developing a plan together? I hadn't planned to talk about um, sales or compensation. But when you started talking, I, it occurred to me that maybe we should talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, when I and Kevin, uh, when we created Current Wealth Management, I said to myself, I, I don't think we ever want to have a, a business that is based on sales. Uh, so your compensation and how you're rewarded is not based on sales. Correct. With the exception that we reward our uh, our employees when they bring in a new client. So, for example, uh, um, I, I think we can share this. Uh, all we have no salespeople. So we have uh, the typical brokerage firm, the typical financial advisor. The uh, advisor gets as much as half half of the revenues that the client uh, pays. We don't do that. We uh, pay our employees a salary for how well they help our clients. And we pay our all of our employees 100% uh, of all clients' first year business. And that's distributed uh, to people like you. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we do that is I never wanted a, a client to be uh, sold to. I wanted the client to be spoken to. When you use the term be understood, it became really, really apparent to me that's your primary goal. And we believe that if our uh, clients are understood and served well, they'll do business with us. And right. uh, I, I believe that we uh, compensate our employees in a way which makes that more likely. So we, our employees get a competitive salary. They get five different bonuses a year. They can all be significant. Sure. Okay. Uh, you have a defined benefit plan. Uh, you have 100%, you have a match on your 401k, whether you participate in the plan or not. It's what, it's what we call a safe harbor plan. So our approach has been if we uh, compensate our employees in a way that allows them to serve the needs of the clients, which if I were, if I were to ask you, what's the most important thing for you and serving clients or doing business with clients, what would you say? 
Um, the most important thing is, I think, being able to split your time between servicing your existing clients and making sure that they still feel like they have a trusted relationship with us as an advisor, while also working with referrals and helping them um, on board as clients. And I'll note to your point before, one of the things that attracted me to Curran when I first was hired was that compensation plan, that there wasn't a sales quota you know, hung over my head that I had to meet on a regular basis. And I think that really allows us to provide quality service to our existing clients because they're not forgotten. It's not bring them on board and, um, you know, get that, that sales compensation and move on. They're not forgotten. They're still very much a part of what we do on a daily basis. And I think that's really important. And I think that's what's helped our client retention over the years. When you have questions that come up with uh, clients, how... How, how do you bring in Kevin, investment, you know, the chief investment officer? How do you bring in Alexis Meeks, who is our uh, tax manager for Hippo Tax Services? Any number of other people that get involved to include traders, mm-hmm. uh, how we do things, how we uh, raise money for uh, required minimum distributions. Talk a little bit about the other people. And sure. How- One of the things that I think has changed the most significantly since my first year with Curran to now is the transition to this team approach. And, um, you know, quality service, I think, is more than just meeting once a year to talk about how your investment portfolio has performed over the previous year. That's important and that's a big piece of what we do. But it's also, you know, determining what else might be important in that meeting. So sometimes that's a tax conversation. And a tax conversation would include Alexis Meeks, our tax manager. We run tax projections often for clients that are helpful in determining um, retirement saving strategies or different, different ways to transition investment strategies. Taxes play a role in all of that. So it's often important that we bring Alexis into that for as, uh, as well. Kevin also is on the investment side. Um, you know, some clients really want to discuss market conditions, um, what our projections might look like, past performance. They want to dive into their portfolio and and really have a, a significant conversation about holdings and strategies. That's where it's important to bring Kevin or yourself into the conversation so that we can um, include more in depth. Uh, you know, details surrounding those questions. Same thing with the trader or even Derek, um, vice president of wealth management. Uh, We'll bring him in often as well for more complex financial planning scenarios. So I think it's important that clients understand that when you call current wealth management, it's not just me. It's not just you. You have a team of people that are working with you um, often behind the scenes, but then as well, they can very much join your meetings and be a part of those conversations. When I, uh, when we started uh, Current Wealth, one of my concerns was that uh, the typical approach uh, that the industry uses is um, uh, a team of uh, advisors that uh, depend extremely on the revenue that the client base produces and how that uh, controls the, uh, the delivery of business. Now, when I say that, I say that from experience because that's the way I grew up in the, in the business. I grew up uh, being the financial advisor, being the go-to person. And uh, while, yes, we always had the uh, resources, uh, the resources were maybe in San Francisco or New York City. They weren't in the office. And what we've tried to do is bring together a a team of uh, investment professionals to include accounting, investment management, trading, corporate uh, corporate services, all in one place so that they're not distant, they are part of the ongoing approach. So I grew up, it's one of those things that I I said uh, in one of the earlier podcasts, uh, I learned a lot of things that I said when I did it myself, when my name was on the on the wall, I didn't want to do it that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we 
don't do it that way because I don't think it's the way to deliver maximum services. And I think, uh, Emily, you're a good example of uh, how we do things and how that doesn't fit into the traditional um, delivery of financial services. So now we have the client, they're on board, uh, they get to know uh, what we're doing and financial planning is a part of it. Uh, I think today, more than ever before, people are concerned about retirement, uh, retirement incomes. Do I have enough money to last? How will I get my money when I'm mm -hmm. retired? Uh, a little history here, 20 years ago when we sat down and talked to a client, uh, their primary concern is what they would do with their estate. And now that heart, that doesn't come up as much. Uh, how do I get my money to my children? How do I get my money to charitable uh, interests of mine? The primary question is always, will I- Have enough to retire. Right. Yep. Will I run out of money? Yep. And uh, that has occurred over the last, well, certainly since you've been in the business, mm -hmm. but it has really, really been a big factor when the typical client sits down. Will I run out of money? Yes. So how do we handle that? Um, I'm going to, the Monte Carlo analysis is sure. one way. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I'll, I'll say that I agree that I think the two biggest questions I get is, do I have enough to retire? Will I run out of money is, is number one. And number two is, uh, when do I start switching to bonds? And the answer to both <laughs> questions is it, there's no blanket answer. It depends. Right. And so that's where planning and analysis comes into place. And so one of the things that we do is take a look at a client's full financial picture. So that inclu includes, you know, current accounts, outside accounts, um, income sources, pensions, social security, um, expenses. And we can do that in a couple of different ways. We can work through a budget. We can look at tax returns. There's a different, you know, a number of different ways that we can handle that. Uh, we look at how accounts are invested. Uh, we look at goals in particular. So what? when do you want to retire? Um, when you retire, are you keeping your home? Are you downsizing? Are you thinking of purchasing you know, a vacation home? We, we try to have a really in-depth conversation about what retirement will look like first. And then from there, we can use uh, the tools that we have to put together a comprehensive analysis. And that analysis really focuses on all of those aspects. We make some projections about performance. We make some projections about inflation. And then from there, we kind of can back into, you know, based on your current scenario, based on your savings rate, uh, this is how much you'll need at retirement. And that can change regularly. So it's important to revisit it uh, often. But um, that's really the, the primary focus of, of that kind of analysis is determining, well, what will you need at retirement and what is then a sustainable withdrawal rate? And that's different for everyone. You know, for those who have pensions, uh, that would look very different than someone who does not. Um, for those clients who are focused on a legacy for their kids, their plan is going to look very different than someone who that's not as important. So it's it's really identifying the unique goals for every client and then putting together a plan that makes sense and revisiting and revisiting regularly um, to make sure we're still on track for that. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about Monte Carlo? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll maybe um, comment a little bit too, but why don't you talk about Monte Carlo and how we use that uh, to determine if someone has enough money or not? Sure. So the, the analysis is two part. The first part is, is a straight line projection. So based on the amount you have now, based on the uh, return assumptions we're using, inflation assumptions, expense assumptions, we project that out from now until we typically use age 95. And it's a straight line projection. Everything grows by a certain amount per year. Your expenses grow by a certain amount per year. And that's helpful, but that doesn't really take into consideration volatility. So that's where Monte Carlo um, is useful. And what Monte Carlo does is it takes those same projections and assumptions that we just reviewed 
And the only thing it changes is the return sequence of the investment returns. So it demonstrates how volatility might impact your probability of success. So it runs your projections through a thousand different trial runs. Each trial run represents a different sequence of returns. And the result you get at the end is your probability of successfully having money at age 95. And so that helps us determine uh, where you might fall as far as planning goes. We usually consider anything above an 80% to be a pretty successful plan. Um, If you fall in that range, great. There's not much we have to do. But if you don't, it, it just you know, signals that we need to tweak some things and work on some expectations and and maybe make some modifications. It doesn't happen often, Hmm. but. Talk a little bit about how bonds factor into that. I'll comment that when people are in retirement, they frequently believe that they will improve their chances of successfully uh, navigating retirement, having enough money if they uh, buy more bonds. Mm Uh, comment about that. Yeah, the the a common uh, viewpoint is that the closer you are to retirement, the more bonds you need in your portfolio. And and in some situations, having fixed income or, or bonds in your portfolio makes sense if you want some stability as you start drawing from your accounts. Um, but you know, particularly over the last couple of years, where we've seen, or the last year or so, where we've seen inflation significantly rise. Um, that needs to be taken into consideration and return expectations for bonds do not outpace the inflation figures that we're often using for some of these retirement uh, scenarios. And so it's important that you are, or that clients, I should say, are being mindful of that and maintaining property proper equity exposure in their portfolio to achieve returns that are significant enough that they'll be able to sustainably withdraw from their portfolio over the long run. While also, you know, your equity to fixed income ratio is very personal as well. You want to make sure that you've got, if you're someone who is very weary, you do want some stability in your portfolio to, you know, perhaps provide you some comfort when the market is is uh, a little wobbly. <laughs> but, uh, but it's important to keep in mind, I think, the significance equity plays in a portfolio over your lifetime. How do people respond, react when the question comes up and we tweak uh, a projection using Monte Carlo to add bonds or decrease bonds when they see that actually probabilities for success uh, correlate with more stocks? Yeah, I think it's surprising for most people because I think there's, it's still very um, ingrained in everyone's line of thinking that when you retire, you increase your fixed income. And um, when you actually portray what that looks like on paper and show how that impacts your account value growth and um, sustainable withdrawal rates and, and all of that, I think it's surprising for most people to see the difference in, in wealth when you compare the two? I think uh, from my point of view, I I think it's very important to show clients that the decision is still theirs. Mm -hmm. But I think that decision, no matter how they choose to act, is a whole lot better when they see that sort of uh, illustration. Right. Uh, There's more um, what I would call a reasonable expectation then. Yes. Yeah, and I think for some, uh, the peace of mind that having increased fixed income exposure in their portfolio is worth it. And as long as you lay that out, as mm-hmm. you as you noted, and you provide comparisons, um, it, it can be a very personal decision as well. And we can uh, certainly show someone that if you choose to do that, uh, and for example, have what most people would de- re- describe as a more conservative portfolio, if you reduce your withdrawal rate, Mm -hmm. that may help a lot in keeping your um, uh, probability for success high. Right. That there could be a trade-off. Take out less, get a more conservative portfolio. Right. You get less volatility, you get a high degree of certainty, but you recognize that you might have to take less out every month. 
Right. Yeah. And that's that's uh, the guessing game when we put together these types of analysis is, um, you know, often we'll put together a base scenario and from there we'll add um, alternate scenarios. So what happens if your withdrawal rate decreases or increases? What happens if you save more now? What does that look like? What happens if your investment allocation changes? And I think highlighting all those different options is important um, to help the client understand how their different decisions can impact their plan over the long run. I wanted to uh, kind of digress from this conversation a little bit because uh, one of the one of the um, factors that I think is uh, important, uh, at least in the delivery of financial services, is someone like me who has spent their entire adult life, even educationally, a lot of it was in the area of finance. How do we, how do we keep that history, that, that in place and still involve younger people, much younger people like yourself. I think it's very important, mm -hmm. especially in financial matters, to entwine those. And uh, I, I can confess that uh, at my age, I've learned so much about particularly people and the human side of investing that I, I, I didn't either have the time or the inclination or whatever to to uh, learn when I was younger. And I, I've come to believe, and this is a bias on my part, but I've come to believe that if you can deliver services that allow the, um, the uh, older, the wisdom to flow through in the culture of what we do with someone like you and our clients, that is something that money can't buy. Mm -hmm. What I've learned in the last 15 years, I've learned so much that I couldn't have learned and executed if I retired when I was 65. So I, I think it's a big, a big part of what we do. And I believe in the area of financial services, particularly when we're dealing with people who run the age spectrum uh, with families from 20 to 30 somethings to uh, the senior uh, my age, to be able to have conversations that can incorporate your view as a young mother, parent, financial service provider, me as one who's been through that, done that, mm -hmm. and now uh, looking at things in a much different way, I, I believe it's something we bring that uh, uh, money simply can't buy. It's something that only time can buy. And I, I believe that uh, one of my goals is to be able to convey what I call the culture uh, to a much younger workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin was on before you in a previous uh, podcast yourself and a, a staff of people that we can incorporate all that. And I, I believe it's, I can say things to the clients who you are responsible for that you probably would feel a little uneasy saying where I can say, let's talk about nursing homes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a whole different uh, uh I, one of the things I like to, I don't like to say it, but you've heard me say to uh, 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 more uh, mature clients who are planning for uh, that part of their life. And I can say, you know, you can make that decision or someone else will make it for you. Mm -hmm. Now, which one would you rather do? And of course, people my age would always say, well, no, I want to make those decisions mm -hmm. myself. So I can be a part of a conversation. And I think you've probably heard me say that, uh, which I, I think makes a meeting uh, unique. As you know, uh, I don't take place. I'm not involved in a lot of the meetings. Um, I try to play the role that I think I can play at uh, this time in my life. Um, so your your title is wealth manager for a reason. Mm -hmm. You call on me when you need me, but I'm always available, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, you know, clients who have been with you for 
decades who mm. appreciate when you do stop in and, and say right. hello. And uh, it's nice to have you in the office regularly and, and able to do that when clients come into the office. And we have children of clients who uh, I've known for 30, 35 years, maybe 40 years. And now you know them, their children, and in some cases, grandchildren. I don't know them. Mm -hmm. I know the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, dynamic to watch unfold. And I think it's really nice that we do have a number of clients who involve their kids and bring their children to meetings um, to just start the process of, of listening and getting a better understanding of what an advisor can do for you and what saving can do for you. And we have a number of clients who do that, which is, which is nice. And then those kids become clients. And so we're in a way, you know, starting to get the ball rolling with younger generations, which is, I think, important. One last question, Emily, what do you think is, um, in, in your pursuit of uh, your career in financial services, what's the most gratifying thing you, uh, you feel on, uh, in your career? I think the most gratifying thing is working with a client who truly appreciates what you're doing for them. And that is, I think oftentimes, we do this so often that it comes naturally to us to think about retirement saving and insurance and estate planning. And it's something that we think about daily. And for a lot of our clients, this is not what they do for a living. So being able to sit down with a client and work them through that and work them through those, you know, it's, it's easy to ask someone, what are your goals and your objectives? That's a hard question to answer. So being able to work through that and um, identify that and put together an analysis and a plan that makes sense for them and, and watching them, it's one thing also to put a plan in place, it's another thing to execute it. So then to have that you know, work over the years and, and feel that appreciation, I think is, is extremely gratifying. I think we do a really good job at that uh, with our clients. We like to say, if we can't read between the lines. We can't read at all. That's right. <laughs> frequently, uh, that's, that's an important uh, thing we need to do every day. Emily, it's been a pleasure having you with us. It's a pleasure having you at Curran Wealth Management. Thank you so much. I thank you for watching this podcast. This is Tom Curran. Goodbye with thanks. Thank you for watching and listening to the Investing Ahead podcast with Tom Curran. Look for the Investing Ahead book and audiobook available everywhere. Executive producer Brendan Kennedy. Directed and produced by John Wager. Engineered and edited by Adam Russell and Aidan Fitzsimmons. Filmed and recorded at Galileo Media Art Studios. Copyright 2024 Thomas Kern. All rights reserved. For more information, visit investingaheadpodcast.com.